paging Liz Engelman. Liz Engelman, the operating room needs you. Dr. Engelman, I'm right here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I I'm leaving. She doesn't need me. I'm, I'm Liz Engelman. I was um, president of this organization. Um, 11 conferences and 10 years ago for the 20th anniversary, and it's great to be here for the 30th. Before, um, before I start sharing some past president reminiscences of gifts that LMDA have given me, I just want to take a moment and ask if you're a uh, first timer to the conference, if you could just stand up, because this goes out to you. <laughs> <laughs> So this is for you. Um, for everyone else, could you also just take a moment and close your eyes, and if you can just remember um, your first LMD conference, and just take a moment and remember something about that conference that was lovely and pleasurable, and if it wasn't at that first conference, just remember another lovely, pleasurable moment at LMD. <laughs> and just hold that with you. I've had my first moment for 24 years, so <laughs> I'll keep this one for a while. Um, so I just want to start to, by saying that I had my, I st I had, my first conference was 24 conferences 23 years ago, which is more than half my life ago. Um, so a long uh, history with this annual conference. And my, again, my, my presidency was 10 years ago, 11 conferences ago in Austin, Texas, which is now where I live. And I think there was something about planning a conference in Austin and getting a vibe of a city that I was intrigued by led to my living there now, and I have LMDA to thank for that inquiry and investigation of a new home. Uh, and of course, this is a constant home for me. And I just wanted to say, when I first went to my 1992 conference in Seattle, I just graduated undergraduate, and I asked my parents if I could, <laughs> for a graduation present, go to an LMDA conference. And I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> best gift I ever got. Um, and I don't remember much about that conference. I don't remember other early career dramaturgs there. We weren't called early career dramaturgs then. But I just remember sitting in one of the sessions and seeing people who I'd only read about in a room together, Mark Bly and Catanio and, and others, and just thinking like, oh my gosh, like they're real and alive and they're nice. And, <laughs> and afterwards at the conference bar, I just thought, my god, this whole profession can fit in a bar and they're talking to each other and having a great time. So I just want to just put out the gift of like non-hierarchical collegiality. It's a mouthful, but that was a big gift. Um, and that made me come back. And skip forward about 10 conferences, nine years later, I was actually living in Seattle. Um, being there again had made me make another home. And I was contemplating a job change and a location change. And so I saw it Mark Bly and I, at a conference, and I asked him some he actually asked me, as a true dramaturg would, some questions and offered some opinions. And I just want to throw out another gift, lifelong mentorship. Um, rewind a little bit. When I first got to Seattle, um, I was reached out to by Jeff Prohl. And he invited me to be a regional vice president of the Pacific Northwest. And I said, thanks, but um, I'm not really sure what LMDA is doing for me right now, what, how I'm feeling about it, I, I, I'm not, he said, great, so you're going to help plan the conference. Um, <laughs> so I just want to put out the lifelong leadership. Um, flash forward, I was planning another conference in, in Austin, and, um, and I was going to plan the next one in Minneapolis, and I did a poll to Julie Dubner, I said, um, I want to make sure that other early career dramaturgs don't have to use their graduation gifts <laughs> to get to conferences. Uh, I'd like to start away, we can get some e ECD travel money and, and develop um, ECDs at the, at the conference. Um, you're interested in that, would you do it? <laughs> she had that same moment of, I don't know, I said, well then you're doing it. And I just want to just put out another thing is when you have interest and opportunity and you match it with somebody's strengths and passions, that's a gift of, M of LMDA. And then I just want to put a, I don't know, a, a, a gift out there which is teamwork. And just to thank people like Shelley Orr and um, DJ Hopkins and people who are on my, um, my executive committee when, when I was president. And it was, it was such a joy planning that 20th anniversary with Shelley. I don't know if she's in here, but um, thank you. Uh, just to look back at where we came from and look forward where we're going with you was a, was a pleasure. 
Um, and, I, and it's hard to remember, too, that there was a before Diane Carroll, but there was. Um, there were several. Diane Carroll has been such an amazing um, administrator here for LMDA for so many years. Um, and there were several before her, and I just wanted to shout out to Louise McKay, who, uh, another gift of Jeff, Jeff Pearls, into this organization, who really helped build the infrastructure that we're standing on now and put together the technology grant that we got with the, LEA, with the NEA, which has really kind of set us up for several, several years running now. I'm babbling, but I want to say um, two more things. Um, and one is that when I start, when I, after I was board chair, because you can only have so much fun for so long, um, <laughs> uh, we were thinking about, well, who, who can follow? And we just, there was no one that we could think of uh, other than Cindy Sorrell who would be as passionate and ceaseless in her advocacy for this organization. And I just want to give a shout out for, for Cindy, who do, has done more for LMDA in a day than most of us ever do in a lifetime. And, and then lastly, I just want to say, kind of running through my experience uh, uh, at with LMDA, running through the DNA of my experience at LMDA is a lifetime of personal and professional collaboration with Brian Quirt. Um, it's been a true pleasure in any hat we've worn, any role we've played, um, any, t any title we've had to invent projects to work on together. And I just, just want to say that he continues to remind me that, again, it's not just the idea that you have, but it's how to make it happen and to make it happen. That's important. And he inspires me constantly. Um, so I just want to, again, say mentorship, leadership, collaboration, courage, heart, mind, Tin Man, <laughs> Lion, Scarecrow. Um, these, <laughs> these guys have really been um, helping me on my journey to home at LMDA, and I just want to hope that I can be any of those to any of you in the next 24 conferences in 30 years. Thank you. So I'm going to get off this perch and give it over to Brian Moore. Thank you, Liz. Good morning. How are you all doing? Great. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Brian Moore. I'm the uh, Associate Professor and Director of the Theater Program at Concordia University in Nebraska. Uh, I am also the Vice President for University Relations here for LMDA and the conference planner and incoming focus group rep for the Dramaturgy Focus Group at uh, ATHA, um, Association for Theater and Higher, Higher Education. Uh, it's been a great uh, opportunity to be able to uh, work both capacities at LMDA and um, at ATHE in order to continue that collaboration uh, as, also, as well as to um, um, try to um, kind of forge the memberships in the union between those two areas. So I'm, I'm, it's exciting to see members of LMDA going to uh, ATHA and vice versa, um, and to be able to um, continue a dialogue of how we can support each other in the work that we're trying to do, um, at least uh, for me at the university level, but also branching out into the other areas of, uh, of LMDA and the spirit of LMDA. Um, and one of the things that I love doing um, especially here and you know for this organization is to be one of the uh, organizers for uh, our annual Hot Topics session. Um, so I am excited to share round two or part two of the University Caucus or U Caucus Hot Topics. Um, it, uh, the idea of Hot Topics is to spark dialogue. It's to share thoughts, ideas, questions, projects, uh, anything that is on the minds of our members and to give them a opportunity, a platform to share those ideas with each other in order to find um, critics, allies, supporters, um, and like and different minded people to continue the dialogue beyond this point. So think of this as kind of an icebreaker to what can potentially become a great thing um, once we are done with this session. And uh, we have a great group of individuals and topics uh, for uh, this morning into the afternoon. So I hope you do um, enjoy them. Um, the rules of hot topics 
are you get five minutes. And we try to be pretty strict about the five minutes. Um, and as I said, it's just kind of the spark. Um, and they are prepared to present uh, their five minutes and uh, to talk about what they're feeling, what's on their mind, what they're doing. And then um, we will give them um, kind of basically keep time, let them know when their five minutes are up, and then we move on to the next topic. Um, so um, after we hear from all the presentations, we will um, open it up to the audience. Um, um, Liz, I asked Liz uh, to uh, help respond, just to make a few small connections, observations um, from uh, from each of these uh, er uh, each of these uh, uh, presentations. And there are some really neat links, which I'm excited to share uh, to to see and share, um, but then to open it up for Q&A, questions that you may have about their topics, and then conclude with maybe any hot topics that you would like to share um, in the world of theater. Um, I will invite you to also feel free to share uh, your hot topics if you don't want to bring them up um, uh, aloud, uh, to share them through Twitter, through the hashtag LMDA15. Um, it would be great to look through those later on and to, uh, to see what people are thinking about. Um, it's also just really excited to be live streamed through HowlRound um, to give that exposure to uh, this uh, format. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to, um, to sharing it with you in that way as well. So thank you, uh, HowlRound, for doing this as well. So without further ado, we're going to begin with Diane Brewer. This is my favorite bio ever. Diane Brewer teaches, dramaturgs, and directs at the University of Evansville. Bada bing, short and sweet. <laughs> and she's awesome. Um, okay, so uh, I taught a class last semester uh, using the Kilroy's plays, and uh, in these five minutes, I hope to provide a simple framework for what is surely a much more complex um, discussion that I hope that we can have uh, afterwards and during the rest of the conference and in our lives. Um, so, uh, so I've kind of broken down my thinking into three um, segments. Uh, first, I want to talk about producing the class, then the experience of the class, and then thinking about the future for this class and maybe other classes uh, like it. So, the basics of how it happened, the Kilroy's list got published, uh, I wanted to read the plays. I knew that I could read the plays by contacting the agents and asking for PDFs of the plays because that's how I read new plays. Um, but, but I wanted to uh, read the plays with my students and I knew that that would be much more complicated. So I called Beth Blickers and I said, okay Beth, <laughs> help me explore the why nots. Why, why can't I do this? Uh, and she was really, really helpful in um, getting me to kind of organize my thoughts so that I could write an email to the agents who represented the first 14 plays on the list. 14 weeks in the semester, I wanted to read one play each week. Um, so, so I emailed these agents um, with the uh, intention of establishing trust, um, uh, being very clear about the fact that I wanted to make sure that the playwrights were paid for the use of their work, and um, then very simply, uh, I wanted access to the plays. I wanted them to send me PDFs that I could make available uh, for the students. I heard back from all but one agent, uh, and I ended up with 16 plays. I mean, I, I, it took a little bit to, to do a little trust establishing work, um, there were a lot of logistical complications um, connected to getting the playwrights play, uh, paid, um, but ultimately it all worked out and uh, we started the semester. Um, and uh, logistically what I did was, was I used Blackboard, I made the plays available to the students in the class. Only the students in the class had access to the plays through Blackboard. Um, I also made it very, very, very clear to the students that um, their access to these plays was connected to the honor code um, and, you know, very clear about what the rules are, not redistributing, not, you know, not even giving them to their friends, not performing them in acting class, you know, I mean, we had that conversation. Um, I have a reputation for taking the honor code very seriously, so that was actually a really easy part of the process. Um, then uh, for the rest of the the class, 
we just read the plays. Uh, and I told the students that I would be reading the plays freshly along with them. Um, we read the plays and then we talked about the plays. Um, these are some of the questions that emerged uh, during the conversation. Um, who are these playwrights? What are their plays about? Are we seeing new conventions? How can we talk about the generational tension that emerges, emerges during the season selection process? Should the list exist? Is playwriting gendered? And how is reading unpublished plays different from reading published plays? And that ties into then my next uh, thinking about the future. Um, I was somewhat surprised, not, not too surprised, but how important it was in the process of the class that the plays the students were reading were unpublished. They were reading manuscripts because that changed the dynamic of the discussion in sometimes surprising ways. So that has gotten me thinking about, well, when I want to do this again or if someone else wants to do this because I think, frankly, Everyone should do this, <laughs> why not? Um, uh, how do we make sure that people have uh, access to unpublished plays? How do we make sure that students have access to unpublished plays? Um, now, New Play Exchange is a great platform for that. So, and I know that the, the Kilrays have been very um, uh, vocal about their efforts to get the playwrights from the list to put their plays on the new play exchange. So it seems like it's a, it's a kind of no-brainer. I went through and I counted how many plays are actually there. It's actually um, 16 at this point. So I don't know, I, I don't feel like that's, that, that that's the solution at this point because, I don't know, it has to be stable and, and all of that. And then the next thing that I want to think about, and this is really maybe more long-term, but, but how do we address classes like this when exposure is not enough, right? When, when uh, what can we do to give, um, uh, or to, to help teachers gain confidence in their ability to guide through students through this process? Those are the things I would love to talk about more. Thanks. Next up is Mark Lord. Uh, Mark Lord is a professor of the arts and the Teresa Helburn Chair of Drama at Bryn Mawr College. He's also the dramaturg for Headlong Dance Theater and one of the co-founders of the Headlong Performance Institute uh, in Philadelphia, where he teaches performance dramaturgy. He studied uh, at Swarthmore College and at the Yale School of Drama. Uh, he's a director, uh, known for site-specific productions as well as original adaptations at Bryn Mawr and throughout Philadelphia, and he is the contributing editor to Yale's theater. Mark. Um, so this is, this is called How to Complain, a Structural and Practical Model for Dramaturgs and Other Revolutionaries. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of on its way from being an, uh, a classroom exercise to help the directors and dramaturgs that I teach feel a sense of agency, um, and in particular to give the directing students that I'm about to teach a sense of responsibility for having um, a sense of direction, um, not just to the scenes that I'm gonna assign them and that they'll choose for themselves, um, but to have a responsibility for a sense of direction um, for our field um, and for their own healthy places within it. Um, so I'm going to start in a familiar place, uh, which is the words of Stanislavski. He refers at a couple points in his writing to spheres of concentration. Um, and over the years as I've taught acting, I've kind of broken that out or sort of built it out into um, three spheres for student actors to think about. The first is the space kind of like within the character's own mind, right? Where Hamlet can go into himself. Um, the second sphere is 
all of the spaces that are in the world, right? The space between me and all of you is a very large sphere of concentration. If I just talk, uh, turned and talked to Kat, you know, have a very tiny and intimate but strange in front of all of you um, sphere. Um, and the third sphere is the sphere that takes in everything, right? Depending on the play text, depending on the world of the play, um, the cosmos might be a really circumscribed thing with a bunch of like recognizable characters lurking overhead. Um, or it could be um, in, in a Beckett play, just you know something that you imagine as like a big rusty metal sky that has nothing above it. So there are those three spheres um, and we'll come back to that later. The second assertion that I wanna make is that um, to complain is to seek to know the world and to seek to know the world better. And this makes complaining, in the sense that I mean it, uh, a little bit different than um, bitching or yunking, which is just a sense of uh, excusing ourselves for inaction um, and um, just kind of going to sail on a, a sea of um, unbreakable sadness. And I actually wanna get to a place where we're complaining to like um, think and improve. Um, and I think that this is a really basic part of who we are. Uh, I imagine our like ancient ancestors coming upon things in the field and thinking perhaps first, can I mate with this? And discovering no. And then perhaps second, taking up the question, well then, can I eat it? No. <laughs> and then to take up the question, well, aside from the answer no to the first two questions, what are the other ways in which this thing annoys me? <laughs> um, irritability is biologists say one of the signs of life, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I want my students, I want all of you to complain, to be irritated, um, and to not um, like try to shunt aside or ignore uh, the pains and the irks, the slings and arrows that the universe, um, that our political system that our own inner lives whip on us, but instead to embrace those things. And I have in my head a sense of um, singing songs of complaint. Uh, I think that the, um, the word complain is derived from a medieval French word that I'm spacing out on, but it's kind of akin to, uh, that be to bewail or to bemoan. And if you think about two different cultural icons, um, an aria of complaint, or to sing the blues of complaint, is to seek to know the source and the description of one's own discomfort in a deep, thoughtful, felt, and precise way, right? That's, that's the, the song of complaint that I want my students and, and you and me to be able to sing. And then come back to this idea of spheres of concentration and think rather than the acting spheres of concentration about the own spheres or realms in which we live, right? There's the personal on one side, there's the professional on the other side, and they move from the deep inside myself place to the cosmic place, and they pass through uh, my closest collaborators, my community, um, my audience, um, my entire city, my culture, the planet. Those are all contexts in which I live. And the, the kind of how to complain, and I'm gonna wrap up, is sing your song into each of those spheres. And in some spheres, there'll be no resonance at all. In other spheres, there will be intense resonance, but it may be different than what it is that you imagined. If I'm complaining about my email, there may be a way that that's connected to a big cosmic 
complaint that I have. It may also be something about my own personal idiosyncrasies deep within my being that I need to adjust, right? So that's like a little template for how to complain. I got examples and I love to talk to you about, you, about them if you're curious. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next up, we have Dan Smith. Dan is the Assistant Professor of Theater Studies at Michigan State University. He holds an MFA in Dramaturgy from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a PhD from Northwestern University. Dan worked ex extensively as a dramaturg in Chicago, most frequently with Caffeine Theater. He is particularly interested in translation for the stage and has published translations of plays by Marivo and Gazzi. Thanks. Um, I wanted to mention my friend Joanne Diaz wrote a dissertation on complaint poetry of the Renaissance, so you should check that out. Um, I also wanted to mention that I'm delighted that we're sitting under the watchful eyes of Euripides and Sophocles above us, so uh, I don't know if anyone has ma made note of that yet. But um, So what I wanted to talk about today is a class I'll be teaching next spring in literary management, which I have never taught before. Um, and the reason that I'm teaching this class, there are two reasons. One is that the university has started an arts and cultural management minor and the theater department is, has been asked to develop courses to serve as electives in this minor. Uh, so I thought, how can I contribute to this? Oh, well, literary management, I've done some of that. So, um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is uh, I work with the Wharton Center on campus to read plays for their Young Playwrights Festival, which uh, is a, an event that they do every year. We have about 50 to 60 plays written by high school students, 10-minute plays, and um, uh, my job is to organize a student reading committee. Um, I recruit six to ten student readers, and we read through the plays. We have to come up with a list of the top 12 semifinalists and then the top six finalists. And what happens typically is that I send out an email, and uh, the students respond via email with their comments, and then we get back the first week in January for the spring semester, and I try to arrange a meeting time with them, and I send out a doodle poll, and three of them respond to the doodle, and none of them have a time that they can meet, and so, uh, so uh, what ends up happening is we don't actually get to meet and talk about why, say, Paige really liked um, a mid-semester's daydream, and Elijah did not, and so, um, so it's, I, I would like to f formalize a way to have a conversation with them about these plays. Um, and so I'm interested in, in using that as kind of the first six weeks of the class is going through this literary management process with them of this Young Playwrights Festival. Um, what has typically happened is uh, then when we, so the top 12 playwrights get a chance to revise and I mentor them through a revising process and then I collaborate with um, the head of the education at the Warden Center, who's a lovely man named Bert Goldstein, who um, has a particular fondness for sad girl plays, um, as, uh, as we heard yesterday from, um, from Lisa McNulty. Um, uh, so anyway, so yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of hoping to get a better structure in place and to get a more consistent um, sense of the reading, of training these students as readers. Um, and so, that, so I've got a sense of what I'm going to do for the first six weeks of the class, and I'd love your ideas about what I'll be doing for the rest of the class. Um, I also wanted to say that I have, I think, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I've never taught literary management before. I then realized that I do incorporate assignments that are related to literary management in other classes. So I tend to have my uh, first year students in the play analysis class design, sorry, uh, prepare a season selection, right, for a theater company. I give them a mission statement and um, they create a four play season for a company. I usually use Steep Theater in Chicago, which has a pretty, um, their mission statement is interesting. It used to be um, we, bring out the truth in the stories we tell through ensemble work, 
which is a very generic sounding mission statement. And then um, they've recently gone to this idea of every man theater. But they have a 60 seat house and the students always want to produce Wicked and made a 60 seat house. And so anyway, that's a very, uh, it, it, you know, so I, I haven't gotten through all of the logistics of that with them. Um, and then in my theater history class, I tend to have them pitch a Greek tragedy to our uh, department season selection committee. So, so I'm, I'm thinking about these things and how I've used these assignments before, but then to sort of develop that into a full length class. Um, and I welcome your feedback. You know, if you want to say don't don't teach literary management, that's fine. But I'm going to anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that's, those are my ideas to start off, and uh, I'd love to have a discussion. Thank you, Dan. Next is Sarah Freeman. Sarah is Associate Professor of Theater at the University of Puget Sound. She co-edited International Dramaturgy, Translation and Transformations in the Theater of Timberlake Wurtenbaker, and Public Theaters and Public Theater Publics. Public Theaters and Theater Publics, and has published chapters and articles in various theaters and books and journals. She won the Gerald Kayan Award from the uh, American Society for Theater Research in 2007 for an article on Joint Stock Theater Company published in Theater Survey. She currently edits theater history studies. Uh, as a director, uh, she most recently staged uh, Spring Awakening, the musical, and Sarah Rules in the Next Room uh, at Puget Sound. This fall, she directs uh, Guillaume de Castro's The Force of Habit in a new English translation by dramaturg Kathleen Jeffs. Sarah. Okay, so mine is called What We're Talking About When We're Talking About New Writing. And I come to this Hot Topics presentation from two directions. The first direction is that my current book project is about Les Waters and Annie Smart staging new plays over the last 35 years. It's focused on shows by four of the writers they've collaborated with repeatedly as a director and a designer. The second direction is that in the past two years, I've been part of the process to officially settle LMDA's archive in the holdings of Collins Library at the University of Puget Sound. So in the UK, where Waters and Smart began their careers, it is now typical to talk about a, a new writing sector of the theater industry focused on new play production, which extends from the most alternative and fringe spaces to the national theater. And there's some good writing on this. Um, Jacqueline Bolton has a really good article in Studies in Theater and Performance, um, and her own dissertation is on dramaturgy in the UK. She's part of that, that wave represented by R. Catlin, too, uh, about writing about that in the UK. And then our very own Harriet Powers and Bob Headley also have an American theater article thinking about that new play uh, sector in the UK now from 2012. Um, but that area was not precisely so sectorized uh, when Waters and Smart were working with Red Ladder and Joint Stock and the Royal Court and the National at the beginning of their career in the UK. Then in the US, the con context is different and, and related, but in order to think about the conditions that they've worked in here since 1995, I thought I'd take advantage of the archive in my own backyard and look at LMDA's approaches to the topics of new play production or the encouragement of new writing. And of course, the way you approach an archive in part determines what you find. I went to the materials interested in whether our organization's newsletters and conference programming indicate that there are distinct phases or waves of conversation about new play development, or whether the organization talks about those topics so consistently as to seem like we're constantly talking about, for the, uh, about the need for and challenges of new plays. I also wanted to explore what ideas and themes most consistently arise when we talk about new writing for the theater. And I wondered if the archive could help me see if there's been significant change in the conversation, especially regarding the uh, apologetic acknowledgement of development hell and the exhausted sense of impasse I saw in dramaturgical discussions of new play processes in the late 1990s when I first joined LMDA. Part of what fascinates me about the careers of Waters and Smart is the alacrity with which they move on in and with new writing and the ways that the organizations with which they often work do seem to me to be innovating, revising, risking, and finding ways to both do more and do less around new play development so that the plays get staged. So as happens with archive work, I partially answered my questions and in some ways I couldn't answer them at all. By the time I looked at three folders of material, I was deep into information about LMDA's second annual conference in Minneapolis in 1987 on the theme Dramaturgy and the Development of the New American Play. 
<laughs> Just like when I wrote, uh, uh, when I set out to write a chapter on gay sweatshop for Methuen, and I became obsessed with reconstructing their 1985 10th anniversary festival, I got a little obsessed with reconstructing the 1987 conference. Um, so that's where I stayed, primarily. Uh, we brought, as one of the documents that Maddie brought uh, for display, this beautiful um, flyer, which has the, the flyer, and then on, when you open it up um, on the inside, there was the, the registration and then the schedule all in one inside. And then I made a handout that's on some of the tables that shows, um, as noted in Mark Bly's own handwriting, right, um, the, the, the sched this is the final schedule, final program schedule with his handwriting on it. And then behind it are two pages out of the proposal uh, or description of the conference um, for a proposal that went to some granting foundations. So when I put this on Mark Bly's table, I said, this will be a blast from your past. And he went, <laughs> so, um, I, um, I find the goals um, I, uh, outlined on that proposal um, particularly moving on page five. Um, in addition to looking at, at that, um, that the schedules um, and that proposal, I looked at all the materials submitted to funding bodies, as well as the personal correspondence that detailed the ups and downs of seeking and waiting for that funding. And let me just note that the cycle of spending out of your own pocket and waiting for grants to reimburse you never ends. Um, the conference received in the end support from Dayton Hudson's Foundation and the Jerome Foundation, as well as in-kind support from the University of, of Minnesota where the event took place. Uh, I also looked at handwritten notes taken during some of the panels, and I looked at the feedback forms um, that people sent in or filled out as they finished going to the conference. Um, and as you can see from that conference schedule, Robert Marks, the director of the NEA theater program, delivered the keynote speech at that conference, and the conference was co-sponsored by the Playwright Center, which was in the middle of its Play Labs performances at, at the same time. So the schedule moves back and forth between Play Labs readings and panels. And uh, that, the frustration of those overlapping panels and play readings um, provoked a fair amount of discussion in the responses for the conference. That tension between actually reading and responding to new plays and panels analyzing the um, methods and reflecting on the work that goes into reading and responding to new plays seems central to me um, in LMDA's negotiation of, of new writing. The 1987 conference indicates that within two years of its founding, um, LMDA put front and center the question, has dramaturgy made a difference in generating the most favorable conditions for new plays to appear and flourish? The conversation is ongoing, uh, but the notion of waves still speaks to me. Annual conferences have themes focused on new writing in 1987, 1980, 1993, and 2000, or, um, so every six or seven years, and then I'm not as strong, I didn't get as far in the archive as the uh, 21st century, so apologies to the things that came after 2001. Um, there were interstitial events closely uh, tied to that rotation. So in 1987, there was a panel here at Columbia about the construction, deconstruction, and reconstruction of texts that came to be called the Performaturgy Panel because of a Richard Schechner speech at it. Uh, in 1994, um, there was a panel in New York with the Dramatist Guild about commissioning. In 1999, there was a joint meeting between the Dramaturgy Focus Group and the Playwriting Focus Group of ATHE. Um, and in 2002, there was a Canadian event focused on workshop processes. Uh, I still need to do the full history of the script exchange, so I didn't even get to that in the archive either. That definitely matters to the thinking. Um, so as you can see, um, I'm still in the midst of my research, and this has been a snapshot report. My sense is that there are definitely times when other issues um, take focus and the drive is generated to talk about other things, but we seem to be on a sort of six-year, seven-year life cycle where the question of new, new writing is going to come back as maybe the strongest focus. Um, and I have to wrap up, so I will say that um, I do tentatively think that um, in the records and the programming that the reflection on new writing and new works creation has become more experimental and varied since the start of the 21st century, uh, especially as notations around text, uh, notions around text and workshop and collaborative creation have become more fluid. The conversation isn't always about the development of the new American play anymore, but it is insistently about text, trust, repertoire, writers, the stage moment, event, and story, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about new writing.
Thank you, Sarah. I feel the urge to sit at your feet, Christian, as I introduce you. I don't know. <laughs> it's just like so like great. I wanted to say. <laughs> Christian Parker, a Columbia MFA grad, most recently stepped down as Associate Artistic Director of the Atlantic Theatre Company after nearly 13 years in order to pursue more of his own work as a director, dramaturg, and consultant. Most recently, he directed Le Leslie Avazian's new play, Out of the City, for the Merrimack Repertory Theater in Massachusetts, and served as dramaturg for the Atlantic's world premiere of the musical, musical Found by Hunter Bell, Lee Overtree, and Eli Bowen. Christian has produced, directed, and dramaturged over, over 50 premieres of new American and British plays on, off, and off, off Broadway, including serving as dramaturg for the original production of David Auburn's Proof at Manhattan Theater Club and on Broadway. He speaks Russian and was part of the National Artistic Advisory Board for the CITD New Russian Plays Initiative. <laughs> and actually, he probably like saved my life and gave me almonds on the subway. Um, in Moscow. In Moscow. Moscow. Not here. <laughs> he is a proud founding member of the new itinerant theater company, New Neighborhood. He is currently the chair of the graduate theater program at Columbia University. We're so happy about that. Where he also has the MFA concentration in dramaturgy. He is a Tony nominator. I give you Christian Parker. Um, I should say that actually, before I ever, well, the first person I ever met in the field of dramaturgy was Liz Engelman, who uh, I spoke to when I came as a prospective student to Columbia in 1994, something like that, five? I don't know when it was. I enrolled in 95, whatever it was. Uh, but she was the one who coaxed me into the field accidentally, and so she's to blame. Uh, <laughs> So m the title of what I was going to talk about today uh, is Do or Do Not, There Is No Try, How to Quit Calling Yourself a Dramaturg and Be One. And I came up with this sort of idea. It sort of came to me before I quite knew exactly where I was going to go with it. But uh, I, I was listening to, to Mark's presentation, and I thought, oh, God, that's exactly, that was ac actually part of the impulse. I, when I was in graduate school, I complained a lot. Um, and one of the reasons I complained a lot was because I had a professor when I was getting my MFA, who was insistent that I was, that we, not just me, but we were never gonna get jobs as dramaturgs, we were never gonna get jobs as literary managers, we should quit thinking about it that way, and that uh, uh, we needed to really think more broadly about what we were doing and why we were doing it, and we should probably just try to do something else anyway. And uh, I resisted this so fervently, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, I actually didn't know that I wanted to be a production dramaturg or a literary manager, but uh, I, in fact, I didn't really think I did necessarily. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to lead, uh, but I, but I resisted this so hard, and I resented her, and I, it bugged me so much. But what I was also experiencing around me was that all of the rest of my training, for the most part, was predicated on the assumption that I would be those things. And so it was a real cognitive dissonance, which was why it caused me to complain, and it really drove me nuts. And so, in my own role. Um, leading this program, leading the dramaturgy program, and now uh, being chair of the MFA program here, and beginning a process really for the first time in its history of trying to really integrate the disciplines. W the thing that I'm most thinking about is, well, why must we continue teaching dramaturgy specifically predicated on what I think are, in my experience, outmoded assumptions about the way the profession works and where it's headed. So that actually, as I look back, that particular professor was really thinking quite ahead of her time. Um, she was the one who was right. I mean, I learned a lot from the other stuff, certainly, but, but actually she was not wrong. Um, I did end up going into literary management initially and did a lot of production dramaturgy, but she was, she was still right. And so, um, uh, anyway, so where this has led me is to think really specifically about uh, how, as, as someone who is training uh, deeply indebted graduate students for a profession, uh, for the broadest range of professional opportunities that they can find. How can we, how can I trick them, not trick them, how can, how can I trick them into staying in school? Uh, how can I, how can I, um, how can I and my colleagues um, kind of embrace the discomfort of the not knowing where you're headed in how we build our curriculum and not predicate our curriculum on and the way we teach on assumptions about how it's been and what the role must be. How can we um, uh, 
stop being shackled by long-standing, uh, what I think are the long-standing assumptions in the, about uh, dramaturgs, with a capital D, being responsive fundamentally, semi-artistic, support staff for other artists with actual vision, and how can uh, I start to frame the study of dramaturgical skills as uh, the key to unlock a number, any number of professional doors that I can't even think of uh, for my students. How can, how can we break down some of these older, old assumptions about even the personality required to sort of practice dramaturgy? Um, so that's sort, of, that's sort of where I'm at, sort of in, in floating that question out there, actually, for the group in terms of what your thoughts are and what, what that might look like, what that means. I mean, I've, I've put certain things in practice here in our curriculum that, that I think try to address that, but which to me involves certain areas of, of focus. Leadership, practice in other disciplines, which to me is really, really important. Um, making yourself vulnerable, what does that mean for someone who's studying this subject? Producing work, being a generative artist, whatever that means to you, and doing your own homework, not the, work, the homework for other artists. Um, I also believe um, that uh, one way to sort of combat this notion of constantly having the, to discuss over and over again, not only what is a dramaturg, but how do we get to the table, how do we get invited to the party, is to just change the party, to start a different party, and actually try to actually imagine, I'm trying to actually imagine, I haven't figured this all out yet, but I'm trying to actually imagine how, through, this, through the teaching of dramaturgy, at the graduate level, or even, even at the undergraduate level, um, can we actually em embrace the change that's happened in the, in the profession, which has made some of the old, sort of the old jobs, as they were, associated with dramaturgical skills and dramaturgical study, obsolete, how can we actually embrace that? How can we actually look to infuse the rest of our field with better dramaturgical skills so that we don't have to worry about whether those old jobs exist? We've, we have somehow positioned ourselves in a new, uh, a new place um, and actually enhanced the field through essentially teaching our own skill set to our collaborators. How, do we, how, can we, how can we do that now? given the structures that exist, given the interest that young artists have in creating new producing structures, how do we, how do we make dramaturgy indispensable while letting the title dramaturg be dispensable? How do, we, how, do we, how do we inspire in our colleagues a rigor about dramaturgy uh, and by, by showing it ourselves uh, without worrying about whether we have one of those traditional titles? Um, so planned obsolescence in a way. I don't, I don't really know what that means, but uh, these are the things that I'm thinking about, so I'm interested to know what your thoughts are on that. Hi, okay, uh, our <laughs> final group of presenters, I'm just, Turn off because uh, there are three instead of two, and I apologize, I don't have information about the third. Uh, um, but I, um, these are members of the Dramaturgy Open Office Hours Project, or hashtag Open Dramaturgy. Um, we have Jeremy Stoller, who's a freelance dramaturg based in New York, uh, serving as a resident dramaturg for Terra Nova Collective and the Jewish Plays Project, uh, and he's a literary manager of the the clack. The clacked. Uh, he is dramaturging the New York premiere of Ken Urban's Sense of an Ending at 59E59 in August. Uh, we also have Catherine Maria Rodriguez, who is a bilingual freelance dramaturg and advocate, uh, co-host of this project, and co-organizes hashtag Wikiturgy, a national edit-a-thon of Wikipedia's American theater coverage. Um, she's uh, recently worked at Center Stage, Steppenwolf, Borderlands, uh, and uh, El, El Circulo Teatro uh, in Mexico, and Catholic University. Um, um, with her studies in Car from Carnegie Mellon and about to enter Yale's MFA dramaturgy program. And I am sorry I do not know, so you can introduce yourself, I'm sorry. Hi, <laughs> my name's Amy Freeman. I'm a freelance dramaturg from Philadelphia. I'm the RVP for Philly metro area. Um, and I host the dramaturgy open office hours there. 
Great. And I am giving them a little bit of extra time uh, as a collective group to talk about their project. So, the way you um, go. So, not with us today are Sarah Slight, who runs the project in Chicago, and Sarah Keats, who runs the project in Seattle. Um, maybe I'll start by talking a little bit about why I began the project, and then Catherine and Amy, who are the ones who are responsible for the expansion, can talk about that. Uh, so, I was a few months into being a freelance dramaturg in New York. Uh, I was meeting a lot of playwrights and was just surprised to find how many of them who had been in New York for years, I was the first dramaturg they had met. Uh, they said, oh, uh, what exactly do you do? I don't know what a dramaturg is, or I don't like dramaturgs, and I'd ask why, and they'd say, well, I never worked with one, I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I began to think about why that might be. There seemed to be a lot of factors probably outside my control, but I wondered about what I specifically could do to make dramaturgs more accessible. It seemed like people felt they were inaccessible or they were a luxury or it wasn't something they were aware of or they just didn't know anyone who was practicing it. So what could I do? I was like, what is the most accessible I could make not only myself but my colleagues so that I could find more collaborators, so that they could find more collaborators, so that we become a part of the practice of new play development or production in general. Uh, and so I spoke to some other dramaturgs who helped me dramaturg through my idea to sit in a public space for a few hours every week, joined by another dramaturg and anyone who wanted to show up to ask us a question about play structure, about the canon, about submitting their work to literary managers, could do so. Uh, f they didn't, w it cost us no money to run, they paid nothing to do it, uh, in and out, and by offering our services for free in a very small way, uh, hopefully to show that they had value. And then I called it, I put project at the end to suggest that it was a question as opposed, uh, which relieved me of any attendance goals or uh, hard outcomes. Uh, and so not only did I sit there for a few hours every week, but we blog about it, we now tweet about it, uh, we sort of explore what comes up for us. I ran that for eight weeks in, in New York before it eventually expanded to other cities. Uh, I had guest dramaturgs from all over the city join me as diverse as possible from institutions and freelance, age-wise, gender-wise, uh, culturally, I tried to have as many different people show up as possible so that writers or other artists who didn't know dramaturgs could show up any week and meet some new collaborators, find out we were friendly, <laughs> intelligent, approachable. Uh, a lot of the questions were actually about industry or business. Uh, how do I write a personal statement? Uh, how do I choose 10 pages for a query? How, who do I send my play to? How do I self-produce? Uh, even more so than it was about uh, specific structural questions. Uh, and what I found, surprisingly, we'd have about maybe six people show up each week, uh, and people would stick around after they asked their questions to listen to other people's questions. And the connections were as much about between the artists and the dramaturgs as it was about between the artists and each other, and they often left connecting with each other uh, afterwards. So I ran that for eight weeks in New York, and then... And then LMDA <laughs> in Boston happened. Um, and I had kind of followed the project online. I saw it on Facebook first um, and was curious about it and thought, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, uh, and then met Jeremy at LMDA in Boston last year. And we talked a little bit. And then um, I think on Facebook you had posted that you weren't sure that the project was going to continue. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so being a little crazy, um, I said, what if we expand it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd love to do it in Baltimore in DC. Um, and he was like, oh, oh, okay. Uh, and then he had a conversation with Amy, I think, right? Um, and talked about bringing it to Philly. Um, and I, in the spirit of the commons, um, which, you know, th these, these conversations are curated in that we just populate the guest list, um, but it's open to anybody, you know, in person or online. Um, we kind of didn't really plan, uh, you know, talking points and just kind of wanted to I guess, have a back and forth and then open it up to you. And we also have people here um, who have attended as guests and then have shown up as, you know, um, just participants. So uh, Kirsten, Linda, uh, Lisa Wilde is somewhere. Uh, yeah, 
feel free, please speak up and share your experiences too. Um, Amy, is there anything you want to say before? Um, yeah, I'd just like to point out that it was interesting how, although it's the same project in each of the cities, it, each of the city distinct, like, had its own distinct flair and its own distinct experience. And I think that's something that long term, if there is a long term, would be really interesting is to kind of dramaturg um, each, each region, um, who's showing up, what are they talking about, uh, is there a pattern to that, right? Uh, and then online, I mean, we've gotten contributions from abroad, um, but I think something that's really important and what we first connected all of us over um, is the spirit of open access, which is what really excites me about projects like this, you know, what you're doing and thinking about leadership and who's at the table, what that invitation is, and uh, Wikiturgy again, um, is we're all here uh, at LMDA, whether in spirit, physically, on HowlRound, um, or on Twitter, because we want to be a part of the conversation and we want to push it forward. And that is important to us. If the criticism, one of them, is going to, about dramaturgy is going to be, we're the gatekeepers and we say no, and we're you know, inaccessible and you know, the pipeline, be to dee. I think it's really powerful for a you know, theater artist just to put themselves out there and say, here we are, um, talk to us, and we want to get to know you. And we have seen powerful things come out of that. Writers meeting the literary manager that's curating a writer's group, you know, and that person becoming a part of it. Um, and I have to also say thank you, you, to LMDA, because um, as Jeremy noted, it's volunteer. Um, but I was commuting back and forth from Baltimore and DC, and then also, you know, I think it's really powerful that dramaturgs were volunteering their time. It's also really important, I, you know, personally, I think, to compensate our artists. So I applied for and got a, a, the LMDA uh, dramaturg-driven grant, so I was able to compensate with small token, <laughs> a small stipend, an acknowledgement, um, and a coffee uh, for each of our guest dramaturgs this spring. Um, anything else? Yeah, I mean, I haven't gotten to talk to either of these ladies about what this past semester of open office hours looked like, so I'd love to hear, I'd love to talk a little bit about who, who was showing up in New York and specific outcomes I noted, uh, and then hear from them uh, just quickly. Uh, so we get a lot of, you know, I, I wasn't sure who would show up to the project, who in New York is without the network of artists yet that they would show up to meet strangers. Uh, it's a lot of early career artists who haven't yet found their network. It's a lot of people who are also entering theater from another field who have had another job and are, have either retired or are moving into theater. Um, and then occasionally people who are already in my network. Uh, attendance has, n has stayed pretty steady as awareness has grown, but what I've noted is that the awareness that's happening about the project and about dramaturgs in general seems to be happening outside of who's actually in the room. That I think the goal of increasing accessibility is unrelated actually to the attendance. That I know people are spreading the word about the project, people are aware of it who I've never met. Uh, hopefully that's increasing accessibility regardless of whether or not they're actually choosing to attend in person. Uh, the other conversation I'm also happy to say that I think we have started to progress is the one with the Dramatist Guild about the role of dramaturgs. Uh, I had reached out to them about publicizing the project. I'd gotten sort of a terse email response. I ended up blogging about that in one of the weeks. Uh, that blog was responded to in the Dramatist Guild publication uh, in an article I can say was uh, error-filled and I think, <laughs> I think poorly uh, argued. Uh, but I believe that that article was the impetus for the event in Utah that was a Dramatist Guild LMDA uh, co-hosted event. Martine, I don't know if she's in here, could maybe corroborate that that inspired that. So the fact that that conversation is progressing, uh, I think we had a little bit to do with, and so I'm happy about that. Yeah, and we had, we had a, in Baltimore, the local um, uh, DG rep uh, reached out and you know, is, is curious about it and, and is wanting to you know, make it kind of a group event in the same way that we had an LMDA mini meetup um, at one of the sessions, uh, you know, in the fall. So I think it's really important. And, uh, you know, whether, whether people show up or not, the gesture, you know, the spirit of being there and being available um, is so important. So we consider it a success 
whether 50 people show up, which has never happened, uh, or you know, zero show up. And there's always the conversation online. And for, for me, since you asked about um, this spring semester, um, it's been much more active online on Twitter. I think that's just the nature of you know, summer, you know, people want to you know, have vacation and semesters winding down and people are going out of town and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, I, you know, I think it's gaining traction and it's getting more on people's radars. Um, and part of this too, you know, you noticed we're, it was one, now there are three, actually five, because two people aren't here. Um, but we're also really curious about who of you and out there online um, are wanting to bring it to your city, right? Um, so office hours and happy hour everywhere, yay! <laughs> Yeah, um, and then to kind of mention what happened in Philly this spring, um, we also did not have the best attendance, which might have been timing or it might have been our location um, tucked away on the third floor of a theater that was kind of off the beaten path. Um, but it really gave me a, t a chance to kind of bond with my dramaturg who was there with me. So it was kind of a chance to check in with another dramaturg every week and find out what she, it was always a, wo a woman, was doing. <laughs> Um, with her projects and just a chance to really like touch base and kind of strengthen the dramaturgy community in Philly. Early career dramaturgs, if you're looking for a way to expand your network, here you go. I mean, it's just, you know, really all it is in terms of setup is picking the dates, which we kind of do because they happen simultaneously, at least in the Northeast where we're all in the same time zone. Um, seeing who's out there, and it doesn't have to be just dramaturgs. We've talked about inviting designers, directors who have, you know, who think really dramaturgically. The, the panel this morning about designers and dramaturgs, they would be great guests. You know, um, the, the criticism panel, let's have a critic, right? Let's have that conversation. I mean, I think, you know, yes, it's, it's about populating and having a conversation around dramaturgy. Um, and you know, inviting guests so that it's not just that one voice over and over again. That there's a, a mul you know multiple perspectives and voices and conversation. Um, but I think as we think about expanding, you know, as we're having this conversation about what is dramaturgy, right? <laughs> um, that you know that that question, right? That's always there. Um, that we can also think about that in terms of who's coming and who are we reaching out to. So ECDs, I totally encourage you. This is a way you can, what was the panel name, Take Charge? All right. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what a great panel of uh, hot topics. This was wonderful. Uh, and I just, I'm excited in um, this capacity of thinking from the standpoint of the U caucus and where do we go from here, um, both through the rest of this uh, weekend, uh, but also for future conferences. Uh, ideas are um, kind of mulling. Um, I, I, and it has been mulling over the last couple of days in terms of future uh, sessions, uh, sessions about uh, uh, bringing up uh, new sessions on um, best practices, uh, and you know how are we teaching dramaturgy these days? How um, in, in, in sessions that have already existed in terms of um, in terms of designers, in terms of critics, in terms of uh, in, 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 in possible future sessions about writing and such, and how we can engage with each other and to connect to each other as well. So um, I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm quite thrilled to hear what you all are, are doing and to see how they're working together and dialoguing or speaking out on what we've heard so far this year, but uh, what we are even talking about what to do from here on out, so. So I just wanted to throw out, a, to say thank you for all that. It was inspiring and just to throw out um, some phrases that resonated with me and then maybe if any of you want to respond to these or um, others with questions that you have. And just starting from that source of what Mark said about seeking to know the source of your discomfort and feeling like some of these projects have come out of what that w irritation might have been or resentment might have been and what that stirred, what that curiosity was and look what we have up here. So um, I'm so glad you're all tapping into that discomfort and getting to know the world better, as Mark put it. So just things that popped out, agency, leadership, being at the table, pushing the conversation forward. What if we, what, what if we, 
Why not? Why can't I? There is no try. Be one. Be irritated. Complain. Sing your aria. Embrace change. Generate. Do your own homework. Follow your curiosity. If you want to read plays with students, get the plays. Teach what you haven't taught before. And none of these are what Christian was saying dramaturgy doesn't need to be, which is responsive or semi-artistic or supportive. Um, there's a great guy on Woodby, on Woodby Island where I used to live, and he, he, would, he would always say, if you want to change the culture, throw a better party. So I'm so glad you guys want to throw one, and can't wait to see you at it. So um, we're going to turn this over for questions. Yes, we're going to um, see if you all have any questions about what's going on, anything about what they're speaking out on. Uh, probably got about 20 to 25 minutes. And uh, then we will um, kind of leave the last few minutes to find out if there are any hot topics that are floating around out there. And remember, you can throw your hot topics on Twitter as well uh, using the hashtag LMDA15. So. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, I am on sabbatical in the spring, and the project that I am working on is, uh, I guess it's dramaturgy or whatever. Uh, I'm going to the Republican and Democratic nominating committees, and uh, starting Jan 1, I guess, uh, depending on how the candidates suss themselves out, uh, I'll be following one of them from each side. So. Um, my question for the group, and something that I'm trying to piece together myself, is um, what are the things um, that you guys think I should be doing while I'm heading down that path? Um, what would you like to be hearing from, um, or what are the, the questions that you have for uh, a little dramaturg running through the political system? Uh, and I'll be applying for a Bly grant um, to pay for bail. That's really what... <laughs> Uh, so if, um, I'm, I'm actually really, uh, I'm trying to shape the project, so um, help me reverse engineer from Philadelphia and Cleveland, how, what are the things that you want to answer about both the theatricality of the political system um, and then the nuts and bolts of it? Uh, Mark, I just wanted to say about irritability, that someone said that from irritation, the oyster makes the pearl, which I always thought was a great thing. Uh, Christian, you were talking about how we get put down and we're supportive and no one sees our creativity. I think there is a thing that drama to exact, it can feel like an invisible art, but I totally advocate people making very strong records of what they do and having those available for other people to see. Like with Mark Bly's book, Production Notebooks, you read it and you see exactly what the dramaturg did. And so for everyone, like in my own practice, I record everything I do, I document it every way I can. So when someone wants to know what I do, I just say, I'll send you the file which shows you what I did for these three plays. And it's very obvious. And then I don't have to tell them, I just say, that's what I do. I also say, I'm workshopping this, come and watch me work. That's, see me do it. Like, those are two, two of the most obvious ways to make what you do visible. Thank you. Hi, uh, just a quick question for the open office hours. Uh, do you want to expand internationally, like yeah. to Canada? Yeah. Okay, let's let's chat later. All right. Okay, cool. <laughs> Ditto for Kansas City. Uh, this is also for Open Office Dramaturgy Project, but for the group at large, uh, because this is a recurrent trend I'm noticing. Um, it would be great to hear more about ways that you're taking a dramaturgical mindset and bringing it to venues outside of traditional settings. Well, I'll just say that when we, um, we had an uh, exhibit in the library when we opened the archive um, this, this February and we did a little reading um, from the 
introduction of Moira Buffini's collected plays. She has a little section of her introduction where she talks about why she loves theater. And one of the things she says is, um, any, anywhere we put on a play is a theater. Right, and uh, the librarian, the head of librarian, when we were doing that, said, "Oh, I, you know, I really maybe we should start doing some readings in the library." I was like, "Yes, maybe we should." The library is a theater, right? <laughs> um, anywhere you put on the play is the theater, and so I guess that's what I want to say: is do, is do the open office hours, also do the plays, right, in those spaces. Yeah. <laughs> with the writers, with the yeah, bring the, yeah, bring the writers to the Open Office Hour Project, love it. What is that, like, where two or more are gathered, I am there, I'm getting a little biblical. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, just I think gathering outside of spaces, and I should mention too that in Baltimore um, and DC it was uh, in partnership and, in, and partly in support, you know, supported by Center Stage, so Jeremy this time around has also been kind of exploring, like, hopping around, you know, different sites, so bringing dramaturgy outside of the theater, um, you know, uh, to, to coffee shops, to s universities, to, yeah, libraries, um, all over. And it's been really interesting, too, to, s to encounter. There was one time, I think it was with you, Linda, right? Where we were at a, we were at a bar, um, and we were just having a, a nice little conversation, um, and this woman walked by, dressed really nicely, walked by, and then stopped, and <laughs> backtracked, and did a double take, and she said, are you a table full of dramaturgs? <laughs> and we said yes. And she said, what? Get out of town. Um, what are you doing here? And we said, we're the office hours. Come join us. And she said, well, I'm a patron at Arena Stage. And Linda is the literary manager. So it was really interesting to encounter somebody that you would normally encounter outside of the workplace and just you know how that conversation shifted. And I think it's really interesting, the comment that was made earlier about the unpublished nature of the manuscript making a difference. Um, the off-site nature, I think, of the conversation also makes a difference. So, I, I, I don't, that, didn't, that didn't really respond to your question, Russ, but kind of, maybe. <laughs> Dan, I just wanted to uh, throw out there in terms of like how to teach literary manager, li literary management, and a lot of the young people that are coming up that are interning for me and things like that, they, they just don't have the confidence in how to have a conversation to ask the right questions, to encourage, to um, provoke in good ways, to uh, let uncomfortableness sit or not knowing for a while sit, right? And so to, I'm wondering if there might be room to model conversations so that they can start witnessing those and observing them, what works, what doesn't in those conversations, missed opportunities, um, and then also practice having those themselves. And then another thing that I thought might be useful is how to pitch a play. So to advocate for a play and how to get behind it and very succinctly and powerfully and actively uh, be able to advocate for a play, you know, with, with other directors and artistic directors and things like that. So to practice that. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think Skype will be a powerful tool for this course uh, if anyone wants to volunteer to Skype it. Maybe I can even find some money for that. <laughs> um, in response to Christian's question about how we can stop waiting for an invitation to the party and start our own better party, um, I had one thought that there must be people doing what we do for theater and playwrights for film and TV and screenwriters, and I, maybe we should invite them. And radio and online video. Yeah, we're, we're, I mean, one of the things that we're working on within this program anyway is a closer relationship with the film department. There's a joint uh, effort in, um, between theater and film and TV writing, actually, um, which is most largely connected to the screenwriting and playwriting programs. But the, my in longer term interest is to get the dramaturgs involved in that. And it is true that people, dram dramaturgs or people with a dramaturgical sensibility, do work in those fields, I think but also most often as generative artists. And they're, they're not necessarily hiring dramaturgs to work in those fields simply as responsive artists either. So I think the question is how do we, um, how do we train dramaturg, dra dramaturgy students um, to um, also be people who are gonna pitch their pilot and write their pilot. You know, that sort of the, the, the separation, the historic, the, the frequent separation of identities between writer 
and dramaturg, uh, I think need to be blurred back together. That, that um, you know, people, uh, a lot of dramaturgs, and certainly when I was studying dramaturgy, I was often, you know, the, the frequent uh, accusation was like, oh, you're just a frustrated playwright. That's why you became a dramaturg, which was not the case for me. I have no interest in being a playwright at all, and I'm not good at it. But uh, many of our students are interested in that, so why shouldn't they be both? And why shouldn't they develop an interest in TV writing if they have it so that they could go be a showrunner and pay off their student loans much more quickly? You know, yeah. Oh, um, so I was, uh, both what Diane said and what Dan said resonated with me. I was teaching my undergraduate um, dramaturgs this year, and um, I partnered with Company One in Boston, and they, um, s uh, first of all, Skyped the artistic director, Sean LeCount, into our class to talk to them about what they were looking for. And then um, they all read plays that had legitimately been um, sent to Company One and learned how to respond to them. Um, and the fact that they were actually being listened to um, gave this huge sense of agency to the class and this greater understanding of what dramaturgy was. And because Company One is such a young, vibrant company that really wanted their input, um, it was a great match. Um, so as an idea for literary management. Hi, this is maybe for Steve, but also something Christian, maybe you and I can talk about. Um, there's a book, new book coming out, Lenora Brown, uh, her second book, which is called New Play Development, How to Facilitate Creativity for Dramaturgs, Playwrights, and Everyone Else. Um, and it talks a lot about what she calls active, active dramaturgy. So that might be, uh, I think it's coming out in a month or so. So that might be something that would, would be uh, good for you. Uh, just a note for Diane, and actually also a question. I want to really commend you for mentioning that you paid the writers for the use of their scripts when you probably could have gone away with the nice educational use uh, exemption. And as someone who works exclusively with young writers, how much that probably meant to them. Uh, before my question, one thing you might want to think about as someone who distributes scripts, all my scripts have a watermark across every single page saying where it came from and who it's for. So if it gets into someone else, so make it really clear to anyone who reads my scripts that this is for you, kind of like when you get screeners from the film industry, it has your name at the bottom of them. Makes it really clear, like if you see this and then you're not part of this group, you got it illegally. Um, so something you might want to consider, might make the agents feel a little bit better too. Um, but I want to know how much did you pay them? Can you talk about how much you paid them and did you get any feedback from the playwrights about what that meant to them? Uh, I didn't get any specific feedback from playwrights about getting paid. Um, it was, you know, I'm, did you ask how I made that happen or? How much? Oh, how much did I pay? Okay. Uh, let me see if I can, if I can remember. Uh, so I charged the students $56 to take the class. Um, that was based on the assumption that they would be getting uh, 14 plays and they would be paying $4 for 14 plays. We ended up getting more plays, so we just ended up dividing, dividing the money amongst the, the playwrights. Um, uh, it, was, it was complicated because I had to have W-2 forms for everybody. Um, I had to... <laughs> get our administrative assistant to communicate with the business office and um, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, there was one really embarrassing, really embarrassing moment when, when an agent received a check for a playwright that was made out to playwright in parentheses, care of such and such an agency, you know, so, ha, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, so there were, there were some of those uh, administrative complications, but, but um, yeah, I, I actually asked the students, at the, I had them take a survey at the end of the class, and I asked them if they thought that they should, play, that they should pay 
playwrights to be able to use their manuscripts, and the majority of them said yes. And uh, actually, I felt like that, like that in itself, uh, was a little bit of a victory. Um, there were 14 students in the class. It, it was a, a range of students from um, uh, people who were interested in dramaturgy, people interested in playwriting, um, performers, technical directors, designers, um, stage managers. It was, so it wasn't just specifically dramaturgy. We got about five minutes left. Uh, we can take a few more questions, or if anyone has any other hot topics that are going on, um, let's see how many we can squeeze in uh, within these last five or so minutes. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Coleman. Um, I'm going to actually, on the topic of payment and things, um, I have a question that I guess is mostly for um, Christian and Dan. Though I think it applies to a lot of. I think it's just a general question about the sustainability of working in this field and working in literary management and dramaturgy, because I think we're all probably a little bit deranged to take this on as a profession and a career, um, but we obviously all do it out of intense passion and love for it. Um, but it's oftentimes a line of work that requires an advanced degree or the people ask for an advanced degree and oftentimes hours and hours and months on end of interning for free for jobs that are scarce and jobs that are underpaying. And I've been told before, why pay you X amount of dollars when we can pay somebody else half that salary who has your exact same credentials? And so I wonder how we go about existing in this world. And then also, this is a second part of this question, which I think is a little bit more tricky and dovetails, I think, with some of the diversity questions that we were talking about yesterday. Um, and this is probably also coming from uh, someone on the younger end of the spectrum. But it seems to me that in order to be able to afford to do these internships, take on these low-paying jobs and everything like that, a lot of the people who are filling these positions are people who have some sort of other income stream or other like ways of getting money. And is that a way that we are keeping the institution, this problematized institution where we're saying it's all like, um, you know, for lack of a, you know, blanketing here, but saying like old white men, that kind of thing, you know? Um, where we feel like we're, are, are we only letting people in who are coming from a sort of privileged background to work in, because they're the only people who can afford to pay, like to work for this kind of money? Here it is. Uh, I have so many thoughts about that. I think one thing that, the first thing that I want to say though is that I, I, by, um, by way of your first question about like how do we do this and oh my God, it's so bleak. I mean, I, that's actually why I'm asking all these questions. It's not, I actually don't want to be the guy who's positioning myself like the professor I referred to who made me feel so frustrated. Because I, I, don't, I don't think it's dire. I think there's every reason in the world to be studying dramaturgy. I think the number of storytelling platforms in the culture that actually can that are um, uh, that might provide a living um, for people who understand story and have stories they want to tell and know how to collaborate and know how to generate work are just growing. I mean, there's more and more opportunities to apply dramaturgical skills in the culture. I think, and I think there's more and more value placed on people who understand how to do that. In the what I'm talking about is these traditional. Um, uh, the, the institutional theater as it exists or as it's evolved through, you know, in this country in the not-for-profit movement. Um, and the fact that it's, it, its rigid structure has created a situation where there, it is so hard to sustain the organizations that there are these jobs which are largely middle management that don't necessarily compensate people particularly well and don't offer a lot of room for growth. I think that's, that's where I'm trying to crack open the conversation about why study this subject and why I actually don't, I try, I, I try as much as I can actually not to fall back into the habit of calling my students dramaturgs. I call them dramaturgy students and to me it's a, an important semantic difference because I don't necessarily see them tracking into those jobs. It's not that they can't, if they can get them and they want them and they get them and they can afford to do them, great, I'm all for it. It's not that, it's not that I'm trying to steer people away from the, sort of the traditional modes. It's just that I want them to be thinking more broadly about it and to be thinking about how other 
storytelling platforms or, or art forms actually might offer them the same kind of creative satisfaction that the theater does because it's the, the, the theater, the establishment, the theater establishment is, is obviously s is slower to change or as slow to change almost as academia is, frankly, you know? So, <laughs> so, so, so rather than wait for, that, for the, the institutions to change, or to find yourself suddenly flush with cash and able to afford a job that has a glass ceiling, do something else, you know, and pursue or find your way back into the theater through a back door. Um, so that doesn't really answer, like, how do I do this? But that's I, what I, I just want to sort of put it out there that I'm not try, <laughs> trying to just paint in a bleak picture of what the world is. I actually think it's a really good time to be studying this. I just, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is try to figure out what I need to be teaching, or what I mean, what my colleagues need to be teaching, and what adjuncts like Morgan uh, that I need to be having on board to kind of help advance this conversation about well, how we're going to apply these skills and how we're going to stop within a dramaturgy program populated with other disciplines, you know, or within a theater program populated with other disciplines, um, trying to batter them into understanding what a dramaturg is and just do it, just perform acts of like. Just, just be the thing and just produce the work, create the creative teams, have the idea, book the space, get the director to show up on time, and, and, and stop waiting for them to ask you to come to the party. So that, anyway, that's all I have to say. Yeah, I'm struck by what your professor had said to you as well about the field of dramaturgy and literary management, because that's the same thing people are saying about PhDs right now, right? Is the PhD is a degree that is not just training you to be a college professor, but all we're doing is training you to be a college professor. Um, and so, you know, I think the humanities have been in crisis since at least the 1970s, and the theater has been dying since at least 1640. So if we're going to be, um, you know, continuing, but yet we persevere, right, yet we, I have a job as a college professor. So, um, you know, so I mean, it is something that can happen. Um, I, do, you know, I don't know, again, right? I don't know, I mean, I came out of college with $17,000 in student loan debt, which, um, and then I stayed in graduate school and deferred those loans for a really long time. Um, and I don't know how possible that is for students coming out with more debt than that now, right? I think that the limits have been raised and whatnot, and I think um, that's a really problematic situation. So um, I don't have a solution for that, but uh, yeah. I just want to say, in terms of internships, I absolutely agree. Um, there are theater companies out there that do offer like housing and stipends. They're rare, but they do exist. And I met one of them. Center Stage um, is just incredible for that. And I have, you know, my cohort is from Mississippi and California and Portland, like all over. Um, so they are really great. And you know, there's an incredible amount of hands-on in that building and some brilliant minds. <coughs> Kevin Witt. Um, uh, for example, uh, and then, you know, OSF has FAIR. I mean, these programs exist, and I don't know all of them, otherwise I would totally name drop, um, but, they, but they're there. Um, but also, you know, Create the Own Work, and LMDA has grants too, dramaturg-driven grant. There's that one grant, forgot the name, about, like, you know, projects that don't have dramaturgs that could use one, so. What, what is it? The residency, look at that. <laughs> Keep the dialogue going, just not right now. Uh, we're out of time. Um, I want to say if you would like to be uh, a presenter on a future Hot Topics, please keep an eye out on the call in the beginning of the spring uh, for future conferences. Um, if you are interested in receiving, uh, looking at resources from past and present uh, from uh, your fellow dramaturgs, check out the website, lmda.org. Uh, especially as a member, you have exclusive access to um, volumes of the LMDA source book, of a bibliography, of uh, the guide um, of colleges and universities, which we're planning to update um, within the next uh, year, year or so, if I'm now with the website up and strong. And uh, otherwise, come talk to these people, let them know if you want to help them or support them or argue with them, and um, keep the dialogue going. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to all of our presenters. Fabulous conversation, thank you. 20 seconds.
If these are yours, come find me. If you are an, a board member, the board meeting now is in the meeting off of the faculty room. 90 minutes ago, some crazy woman got up here and said we were moving the afternoon events into the faculty room. I don't know what she was thinking. We're not. Everything is exactly as it is in the schedule. Thanks for being here. Enjoy lunch. See you at 2.30.